JUnit 5 is the most recent iteration of the popular Java unit testing library that has been around for literally decades now. Contrary to its predecessors, this new version is composed of three distinct components, each with their individual responsibilities. What we call JUnit 5 is in fact the sum of these three parts. First, there's the platform, which provides the foundation of launching test cases on the JVM. Furthermore, it is the dedicated integration point for other developers working on plugins, build tools, and test frameworks. At the core of the platform, there's the test engine interface, which basically provides a set of hooks and entry points that the JUnit platform can detect at runtime in order to execute a set of tests. Now, this course does not go into detail about how to write a custom test engine implementation, so let's leave it at that. The second component to JUnit 5, and arguably the most exciting one, is called Jupyter, and its API defines the new programming model for JUnit test cases. Usually, when you hear someone say that they want to write a JUnit 5 test, what they actually mean is that they want to write a JUnit Jupyter test. All of the annotations, classes, and features presented in this course originate from this set of APIs. Jupyter itself is divided into two subcomponents, which separate the implementation of test cases from their execution by means of distinct API and engine artifacts. Lastly, there is another component, aptly named Vintage, because it is an integral part of the commendable backwards compatibility support of JUnit 5. It allows for the execution of tests written with older versions of the framework all the way down to JUnit 3 on the JUnit platform. By utilizing the power of JUnit Vintage, it is possible to achieve a hybrid code base where older and newer tests can coexist without the need to migrate everything at once. For the purpose of this course, I will assume your build system to be Gradle, but JUnit 5 works just as well with other build systems, like Maven or Ant. When working on a pure Java project in Gradle, you'll first want to enable the JUnit platform through the test closure, which has been providing a method called useJUnitPlatform ever since the release of Gradle 4.6. It allows you to configure included and excluded test engines and tags directly from the build script. The second and final step is adding the required libraries to your dependencies block. In order to write JUnit Jupyter tests, you will add the JUnit Jupyter API artifact to be available at compile time and the JUnit Jupyter engine artifact to be available at runtime. The completed setup looks something like this. In case of you seeking to enhance your existing code base with JUnit 5, you might want to include the backwards compatibility support as well. To achieve this, make the JUnit Vintage Engine artifact available to the runtime class path, next to the other engine. Automatically, the JUnit Platform Launcher will now see the additional engine and execute your older tests alongside the new ones. An Android project is inherently different from a pure Java one, in that it provides multiple build types and support for product flavors out of the box. As a consequence of this, the setup needed to include JUnit 5 into your Android environment is also slightly different. First up, we're going to make use of a third-party plugin which helps with the configuration of JUnit 5 for Android. Make sure to pull it from JCenter from these coordinates. Next, in your application module's build script, apply the Android JUnit 5 plugin underneath the Android Gradle plugin. With this plugin enabled, new functionality becomes available in the Android.TestOptions block. You specify configuration specific to JUnit 5 inside the JUnit platform closure. Each available product flavor in your project is now assigned a filters object in here, and this allows you to configure included and excluded test engines and tags on a per-flavor basis. For example, if you want to include a tag only for debug builds, use the debug filters object inside JUnit platform and add it there. Just like with the pure Java project, you're going to have to include the libraries for JUnit 5. 
For Jupyter, add the JUnit Jupyter API to your compile class path and the JUnit Jupyter engine to the runtime class path. If you require backwards compatibility to launch older tests on the platform, throw in the JUnit Vintage Engine artifact in there too. We're ready to write our first test with JUnit Jupyter. Before we get started, please take note of the companion repository hosted on GitHub. It's a small sample application I wrote, packed to the brim with all kinds of different tests written with JUnit Jupyter. You can find a link in the description attached to this course. Now, let's get to writing tests already, shall we? We'll start by adding a new class to the project's test source set, and then add a method to it. This method is now annotated with the addTest annotation from the JUnit Jupyter library. If you also have JUnit 4 in your project, be mindful to import the correct one here. You can identify the right class to import by looking at the autocompletion hints in your IDE. Org.junit.test relates to JUnit 4, and org.junit.jupyter.api.test relates to Jupyter, which is what we want right now, so let's use that. This is now a test case, which is executed by the test engine at runtime to validate some piece of logic contained within it. In the example repository, I've programmed a game of blackjack, where the set of cards that both players draw from is modeled through a class called deck. We want to verify here with a unit test that a deck can report whether or not it is empty. I create a new deck object, passing in an empty list of cards to the constructor, and then I assert that the isEmpty method returns true for this object. We're going to go into more depth on the power of assertions in JUnit Jupyter later, but for now, we simply use the assertTrue method here. You might have noticed here that IntelliJ IDEA started showing this little icon on the side right after I attached the annotation to the test case. When clicked, it will execute this single test case or the entire test class, depending on if you click on the class. After compiling the project, you're presented with the results of your first test. Sometimes all of the methods inside your test class require some kind of setup, which is always the same. Similarly, you may have to clean up or close some shared resource after each test has been executed so that the inputs of each method are exactly as you expect them to. A good example would be testing a database. After each test, the tables inside the database should be dropped so the next test can start fresh. In JUnit Jupyter, this kind of lifecycle awareness is modeled through lifecycle annotations. The add before each annotation marks a method inside a test class to be executed before each of the test cases inside it are run, and thus it can be used to initialize your tests. Conversely, the add after each annotation defines a method that should be executed after each test. Here's a trivial example which prints out the statements in order of execution. Note how, when executed, the lifecycle methods are called multiple times, once for every actual test case. Aside from before each and after each, there are two additional lifecycle annotations in the JUnit Jupyter API, named at before all and at after all. You can probably tell from their names, but these guys control the lifecycle of a test class on a broader level. A method annotated with at before all is executed once per class before any of the test cases or before each methods are run. On the other hand, at after all methods are the final piece of the lifecycle and executed also exactly once after all tests are done. When I execute this example here, check out the order of the printed statements. With no additional configuration in place, these kinds of lifecycle methods have to be static in order for Jupyter to execute them correctly. In Kotlin, you'll want to use the companion object and the add JVM static annotation for these things as a result of this. Don't forget this additional annotation or Jupyter won't notice the staticness of your method. When it comes to the execution of test methods, JUnit Jupyter by default dictates that a new instance of the test class be created for each individual case. This is called the per-method approach, and we can see it in action in this example. 
Check out the output of this test class when I simply print out the current instance inside each method. When running this, you can see that the hash code is different for each statement. They are different objects. The reason for this being the default is to minimize the shared state between different tests so that every case gets a clean slate to work with. The mode of a test class can be expressed through the add test instance annotation. If you mark a test class with this annotation and set its value to per method, each test will get a new object. Now, as we've seen, this is the default mode that JUnit Jupyter runs in, so you do not have to express this explicitly for every test class you write. However, as we're going to explore the add test instance annotation a little further, the advantage of this annotation will become more apparent. There is a second mode that JUnit Jupyter can run in to invoke your tests, and that mode is called per class. When running with this configuration, only a single object is created of a test class, and each test case inside it is executed in the context of this single instance. When I change the value of the add test instance annotation in this example to per class and run this class again, we can observe the change in behavior. Note how with this mode, the test cases point to the same object indicated by the identical hash code here. The lifecycle mode of the Jupyter test engine can be configured on a case-by-case -case basis with this annotation. Additionally though, this setting can also be configured globally, so all test cases use the same behavior by default unless overruled by the presence of this annotation, at test instance. To achieve this, the Jupyter engine looks at the presence of a certain system property at runtime, which you can provide to the JVM. In Gradle, use the system property method inside the test options to provide this value, per underscore class. For Android projects, use the configuration parameter API inside the third-party plugin's DSL instead. When executing the unit tests through the build system now, the configuration is applied globally. However, be wary that if you execute your tests from the IDE, you might have to apply this value to the run configuration too. In IntelliJ IDEA, you open the run debug configurations window and append the value in the VM options box. When I execute this example again from IntelliJ, we can still see a single instance used for all test cases. Using the per-class lifecycle has further implications on the way you write tests. One of the most useful, at least in my opinion, is the ability to use instance methods for all lifecycle methods. This comes in especially handy if you write a lot of tests in Kotlin, but it's just as valid for Java. Let me show you what I mean. This Kotlin test class uses the default lifecycle right now, and because of that, we have to use the companion object for its before all and after all methods, as well as the JVM static annotation. When this test class is now changed to the per class lifecycle, these methods can be specified directly on the object, and the requirement to make them static is lifted completely. The companion object can be removed, and so can the methods themselves, which move directly into the class, making for a cleaner visual appearance of the class as a whole. Of course, when this is now executed without changing the lifecycle, we get an error message, as shown here. JUnit Jupyter is quite good at highlighting what it has a problem with, so here it's pretty clear that it doesn't like the non-staticness of these methods when running on the per-method lifecycle. When we slap the correct annotation on this class and try again, the output is again as expected. The primary descriptor of a test method's purpose and goal is its name. It should express the contents of the test in a concise way, providing an idea about what the test is achieving to verify, without the need to actually read the code first. Because of this, however, traditionally, method names for unit tests tend to get quite long in Java and hard to read as a consequence. Developers have introduced workarounds within the boundaries of the language to alleviate this problem a little bit. Have a look at this test method, for instance. 
I'm trying to convey here that the test correctly reports if a card is still contained inside a deck using the contains operator, shown here in Kotlin. The name of this test represents an English sentence, which describes exactly this purpose. Reading this concatenation of camel case might be a little straining and difficult to understand as a result. Alternatively, I could have used underscores to separate logical blocks of the descriptor, as shown in this second method. Note that because this file is written in Kotlin, we could use backticks to gain the ability to include spaces in the method name, like so. This will currently only work for unit tests executed on the JVM, however, so Android instrumentation tests do not work. JUnit Jupyter provides a more compatible solution to this issue related to hard to read method names, the add display name annotation. With it, you annotate a test method and provide an alternative descriptive string, which the method will then use to describe itself to the testing framework. We can take advantage of the vast character set allowed inside a Java string to describe a test method. And yes, that also includes emoji. As a rule of thumb, try to choose names for your methods that correlate with their at display name descriptor, simply typed out with the power of the Unicode set at hand. This way, it's a little easier to find these methods again in case you do need to work with their actual method signatures. Lastly, at display name can also be attached on the class level to express the intent of a collection of tests a little more clearly. A test framework that lacks the ability to evaluate conditions to be true or false is a test framework that would probably be considered utterly useless. Assertions are the fundamental cornerstone of verifying the behavior of a test, comparing actual computational results against a predetermined expected output. There are many libraries in the Java ecosystem that introduce concepts of asserting things, such as assert J or truth. None of these tools are incompatible with JUnit 5, so there's no need to choose a different library when upgrading to Jupyter tests. However, the new programming model comes with a set of assertions of its own, out of the box. These are encapsulated in the assertions class. Let's have a look at these groupings of methods. Assert equals and assert same compare the actual result of some code to an expected value, based on equality or sameness, respectively. Think of it this way, assert equals uses Java's equals method to determine if the assertion passes, and assert same compares references using the equal to operator, like the two equal signs. If two objects with identical contents are created, like in this example, they still do not represent the same object in memory. Using assert same would compare the memory address of both objects and fail the test. This test can be fixed by using the assert equals instead, and executing the test again. Of course, it's up to you to implement the necessary Java methods to determine equality first. In this example, Kotlin's data classes do it for me, which is kind of neat. For convenience, JUnit Jupyter also provides some more assertions for determining equality, or even inequality. Assert array equals validates each element of two arrays against each other. Assert iterable equals does the same for Java collections or any iterable object. And finally, there are assert not equals and assert not same, through which a difference between objects can be checked for. Lastly, all of these methods share a similar signature, where the expected value always comes first and the actual result follows afterwards. Optionally, you can also provide a string to describe the meaning of this particular assertion, to facilitate debugging, for example. Here, two strings are compared using this method. During test execution, Jupyter would stop immediately if this assertion failed. Any code inside this particular method after this point wouldn't be hit. The second statement will not be printed out to the console anymore, but instead we get the custom message that we provided in the assertion method. There are two assertion methods that deal with the validation of Boolean conditions, assert true and assert false. If the value given as the condition does not evaluate to true or false respectively, an error is thrown. 
Check out what happens if I pretend to own a king card, but it's actually just a lousy five. If I try to assert that the five has a higher value than the king, this test should fail. When validating conditional logic that boils down to a boolean value, it's recommended to use assert true and assert false over an equality-based approach. These two tests here do the exact same thing, but the top case additionally has to check for equality against the boolean true, while the bottom case uses assert true instead. Nullability is a notorious and often discussed feature of the Java ecosystem, so JUnit Jupyter allows you to write assertions for it as well, of course. Assert null and assert not null check if the past object parameter is null or non-null, respectively. This example illustrates this point. When trying to convert a string into an integer, only strings with numeric characters can be converted. The other case simply yields null. Even though the same method is used for all three values, the correct assertions allow this test case to pass. In older versions of JUnit, there were multiple approaches to test that a certain operation would throw an exception. With Jupyter, the power of Java 8 is used to provide a superior way to test for expected exceptions in the form of the assertThrows method family. With assertThrows, you provide a lambda function that throws an error when executed, and if it doesn't, the test fails. Here, I expect that a certain exception is thrown when trying to draw a card from a deck object that doesn't have any cards left to draw. Using assert throws and Kotlin's ability to place the last parameter of a method outside the parentheses, this can express quite elegantly. When testing for errors, another companion method exists within JUnit Jupyter's assertion class. As the name would imply, assert does not throw acts opposite to its brother, checking that a given lambda function does not throw an exception. With this method, a test case would fail if the past lambda does actually throw an error. The last feature of Jupyter's assertion model allows for composability of assertions. Using assert all, several assertions can be chained together into a single call. Additionally, they may also be nested inside of each other to form logical blocks. Consider a unit test for this user class that has a lot of properties like name and age and also a few methods that use these properties. If we wanted to test that class now using assert all, we can nest together the different assertions into dependent blocks. You can see this in action here. Inside the outer assert all block, I've put multiple lambda functions that each contain a single assertion call, like here for the first name and here for the last name. Furthermore, I'd like to have multiple assertions for the age property. So I put another assert all block inside the outer one and then add two more assertions inside the inner assert all. I use a similar technique for the address property. So I have another assert all block with two more assertions. The same structure would look quite similar in Java, even though the Lambda functions have a different syntax, of course. When we execute this test now, the assert all block would only succeed if all of the assertions inside it are true. Let's run this class to get an example of this. When a test fails inside of an assert all block, the console output refers to the precise location of the assertion that failed. Here, you can find the identifier of the assertion that failed. In this example, it's this assert equals that checks the postal addresses. In the failure report, we also see the original assertion message. So here, it's the output of the assert equals statement that failed. Assumptions provide a programmatic way to abort the execution of a test prematurely if a Boolean condition matches an expected value. They are quite similar to assertions in that way, but there's a key difference. A failed assumption does not mark its test case as a failure. Instead, you basically skip the execution of the test and it's not that big a deal. In IntelliJ and Android Studio environments, aborted tests are called ignored tests, and I think that describes it quite well. In general, they share a similar motivation to other concepts of conditional test execution.
Here's an example test using the JUnit Jupyter Assumptions class, which comes with two methods in different flavors, assume true and assume false. This test validates that if there are not four aces in the default set of cards, then the same set shouldn't have 52 cards in total, because that would make for a non-standard deck. The assertion at the end of this test is only executed on the knowledge that the previous assumption is true. In this case, only if the shared all cards object actually has a number of aces other than four, this assertion is even reached. When executing this test case on a default deck, which obviously has 52 cards, note how it's not reported as a failure by JUnit through the IDE, but rather it's marked as ignored. Next to assertions, the execution of test cases is arguably the most important and fundamental aspect of a unit testing framework. However, there may be cases where you want to not run a specific test method or an entire class. For instance, you may want to skip a certain test class while debugging a problem because its test failures are expected or unrelated, but just not what you're working on right now. Instead of doing the tedious work of commenting out code, you can help yourself with some handy annotation. The most straightforward way to ignore certain behavior in JUnit Jupyter comes with the add disabled annotation. When you add it to a method or its test class, the engine will simply not execute it at runtime, like at all. This particular example describes a test that would fail if I actually executed it, because there is no such thing as a 13 of hearts card. Notice that the at disabled annotation sits on top of the method signature here, and this is the indicator that Jupyter shouldn't be bothered with executing this. In the test report, these methods still show up, however, they are marked as ignored. At disabled is an example of an execution condition, which is a term coined by the Jupyter API for a multitude of different annotations that deal with skipping over tests. Conditional test execution is the overarching term for the set of annotations provided by Jupyter tasked with determining whether or not a test method should actually be executed at runtime. Contrary to the at disabled annotation, which unconditionally skips a test, these annotations look at contextual information in order to make a fair assessment. They usually come in enabled slash disabled pairs, so it's up to you to decide how you want to structure your test. The first pair of annotations is used to enable or disable test execution on a specific operating system. The annotations are called add enabled on OS and add disabled on OS. And each annotation takes in an enum value representative of a specific operating system. Have a look at these examples here. Um, keeping in mind that I'm running on a Mac right now, we can assume that the second and third test methods of this class will not be executed in my environment. This is because the second method, never run this on a Mac, is annotated with the at disabled on OS annotation with a value of Mac. Similarly, the third method, only run this on Windows, will also not be run, because it has the at enabled on OS annotation on top of it, and Mac is not one of the values. When I execute this test class, you can see how two of the four methods are reported as ignored, and JUnit Jupyter even provides a description to you to standard out as for the reason why. This is good info when you're wondering why a test was chosen to be excluded from the suite. It might be relevant to test certain functionality on different Java runtime environments, or JREs for short. JUnit Jupyter makes it really easy to cater to these developers, who can use the at enabled on JRE and at disabled on JRE annotations for their tests. When annotating a method or class with either of these guys, the engine will behave accordingly at runtime, skipping over the tests that do not match the requirements. In my example, only the above test is being executed in this class, because I happen to be on Java 8 right now. When executing this class, JUnit Jupyter provides a reason for not running the below method too, which is useful for debugging.
If providing contextual information to the test suite through Java system properties is applicable to your use case, the following two annotations for conditional test execution might be of interest to you. Using at enabled if system property and at disabled if system property, you can drive JUnit Jupyter to ignore certain methods based on these circumstances. For this example, I'm going to pass a property to my run configuration in IntelliJ, although anyway your build system provides for system properties will also just work fine. I specify this config.value property and assign it an arbitrary value that's reasonable for my use case. Next, on the test class or method, I utilize the annotations with this name and an expected regular expression. Only if this expression matches the property value of this name, the annotation will do its thing and enable or disable this test. When executing this class, only the above test will run, the other will be ignored. Note that if the property is missing altogether, Jupyter will log a warning for the methods annotated with at disabled if system property, saying that the property is not set. For its counterpart, the at enabled if system property annotation, it will also log a similar statement if the system property is not available at all. Environment variables provide another way of dealing with contextual properties in tests, and JUnit Jupyter can also take advantage of those. For this example, I provide an environment variable directly via my build system, Gradle, in its build script file. This value is assigned a string value of true. Inside the test code, use the annotation pair of at enabled if environment variable and at disabled if environment variable to drive the engine into executing or skipping over these methods based on the value of an envvar. With the setup at hand here, we can predict that the top method will be run because the variable with the specified name matches the expected regex. Also, the bottom method is disabled because of the same reason, the variable matches this regular expression. As always, Jupyter will tell you about its decisions and leave a note about why a certain method was executed or skipped. Tags are the logical successor to JUnit 4's category annotation and provide a straightforward way to group certain tests together. The add tag annotation takes a string value, which can be used to configure the test engine to include or exclude annotated tests in the current run. As an example, you could give all of your slow running end to end tests the same tag and exclude them from the default test suite so you can exhibit test driven development and iterate faster over your code on your machine. To achieve this functionality, annotate a method or class with the tag annotation and then provide a string identifier for it. Then, the different integrations for JUnit 5 offer capabilities to attach certain tags as included or excluded. Again, I'm using Gradle for these examples, so let me demonstrate what the integrations look like in Gradle for Java and Android projects, respectively. In Java, you can find the configuration methods for tags inside the test block in the Gradle build script, more specifically inside the use JUnit platform closure. Use the methods include tags and exclude tags to your liking. On Android, the same methods are located under your android.test options block inside the JUnit platform closure. Because Android projects have different flavors, there is a specific filters object for each of these flavors, so you can configure different test tasks in a unique way. Check out this example. Here, only the debug build type has a statement to exclude tags that are marked with the tag slow. A common problem that developers run into when writing tests has to do with shared setup and teardown logic, especially when there's a perceived parent-child relationship between the tests themselves. Some tests share the same setup logic, but then differ in the details. This holds especially true when designing a class according to the behavior-driven development style, or BDD for short. A test declaration here is split into three parts, given, when, and then, 
each with a specific pre-configuration applied in order to work. There might be different whens next to each other in the same class, but they don't exactly share 100% of the setup logic, so a single before each method just won't cut it completely. Let me show you what I mean, because JUnitJupyter has a very elegant solution for sharing state between parent classes and their children, in the form of the at nested annotation. This annotation is used exclusively for inner classes of a test class, and it ensures that the life cycle of the parent is woven into the life cycle of its children. Let's develop an example of a BDD style test using JUnit Jupyter and the at nested annotation. We want to test how a session in our application behaves in a relation to a deck of cards. Starting with the outer class, we initialize a common value, the deck, in the parents at before each method. This will ensure that all test methods get their hands on a fresh deck instance when executing. Next, we create another class inside this class and call it session turn tests. The test methods inside this child class will access the outer deck object, so it's important that this child class is not a static class. In Kotlin, this is achieved through the inner modifier on the child class declaration. Lastly, we slap the add nested annotation on top of the child class, which is the magic glue that tells Jupyter that this child class has to be integrated into its parent's life cycle. After setting up the inner class, we continue with the setup phase of this child by adding another set of life cycle methods here. Think of this inner class as an isolated group of tests within the context of its parent. Test methods outside this inner class will not get the second life cycle. However, the test methods inside this inner class will get the first life cycle. We are going to have a more visual look at this in a second. For now, let's create an actual add test method in the inner class and add some logic here that uses both the deck object from the parent as well as the session object created inside the inner class. As a last step, and for the sake of visualizing the interconnectedness of the two classes, I will add some log statements into each of the methods we just created. It will help demonstrate the order of execution and show how nested actually works. So finally, let's execute this class. You can see that in the IDE, a tree-like structure is generated with the child class method sitting comfortably inside their parents declaration. When we check the standard output, you can see how the outer life cycle wraps around the inner life cycle, and finally the test methods output itself. This is all thanks to nested. Sometimes you find yourself in a position where you're tempted to include a for loop with a counting integer index inside of a test method. The intention behind these kinds of tests is usually to assert a piece of behavior under different inputs at once, without having to copy each individual input into its own test method. In our example application of Blackjack, the value of an ace card changes depending on the current total sum in a player's hand. When this sum is 10 or smaller, the ace has a value of 11, and if the sum is greater than 10, the ace has a value of just 1. I would like to verify that for each possible current score of a player, the value method of an ace object returns the correct value. I didn't want to create 21 different methods with slightly different bodies though, and therefore I chose to do a for loop instead. When I execute this test class, this single method does show up and it will indeed check all 21 cases. However, if it were to fail at some point, it would be slightly annoying to debug without the proper precautions in place. If each invocation of this loop could create its own entry in the list of executed tests, it would be easier to spot which one caused the failure. In JUnit Jupyter, there are several ways to create tests that execute more than once, and the most straightforward way comes in the form of the repeated test. This is an alternative to using the add test annotation on your methods, and it can be configured to run an arbitrary number of times with different inputs. Let's transform our test into a repeated test. First, you annotate the method with the add repeated test annotation, 
Note how, unlike many other of the JUnit Jupyter annotations, this is a replacement for test, not an enhancement to it. Basically, we will tell the test engine to treat this method in a special way altogether. The value of this annotation will hold the number of times we want it to be executed. This can be any positive integer value, and in our case, 21 will do just fine. The body of the repeated test method is going to contain what was originally one invocation of our for loop. After we lazily paste it in from the original method, we find ourselves with a non-compiling code. After all, we don't have access to the loop index anymore. We need to get some info from the test engine itself about the context in which this method is being executed. This works exactly the same as any other external input to any Java method ever made through parameters. The class of choice here is called repetition info, and it's Jupyter's counterpart to the at repeated test annotation. If we look inside of it, we can see that it's a fairly simple data class containing just two values, the current repetition and the number of total repetitions. The current repetition value is basically our loop index now, and it will increment for each subsequent invocation of the test. Conversely, the total repetition count reflects the value inside of the method annotation, and it will be 21 for our case. Let's connect the repetition info to our ace checker test. Using the current repetition value of the repetition info object, it's not really much work to make this compile again, and the result looks like this. When executing this test class again, we can still see the old method using the for loop here. However, we also see the unfolded repeated test next to it. Jupyter generated an entry for each of the values from one until the target value in the annotation. And these generated methods would fail individually if the logic was flawed, instead of the entire thing at once. Let me demonstrate this by breaking the ace card logic. Let's say that I made a mistake when writing this value function, and I accidentally used the greater than or equals sign here, instead of just greater than. After launching our tests one more time, notice how the old method fails, but we don't really know why. All it says is that an assertion failed, but without adding more logging here, we can't really tell where the problem is. On the other hand, the repeated test adds a great deal of visibility to its individual runs, and we can easily spot that for a value of 10, the assertion failed. This gives us the first clue into fixing this issue, and it demonstrates the power of having more granular cases for repeated tests. The names used for the generated test methods default to the statement shown in the IDE here. You can configure this pattern as well if you feel like it. The at repeated test annotation has another optional parameter called name, which is the template for the test's name. To include the current and total repetition values in these templates, you can use placeholders like this, and at runtime, Jupyter will inject them accordingly. We have seen how the at repeated test annotation can help developers write tests with incrementing integer arguments, something that a for loop is traditionally used for. However, at times it isn't integer values that make up the parameters you need for your test, but other objects instead. Here, I have thusly created a static array of parameters and use repeated test to access the values in this array at runtime. The current repetition count is the index into the array, and I'm able to run this for each string in the array. Mission accomplished, right? No, there's a much better and more powerful way to achieve virtually arbitrary method parameters in JUnit Jupyter. The magic keyword is called parameterized test, and its base concept has been around since at least JUnit 4. However, with the release of Jupyter, this feature has been supercharged with one of the most powerful yet concise ways of reusing test code there is. Similarly to a repeated test, a parameterized test replaces the usual at test method annotation and uses its own annotation instead. Additionally, a parameterized test method requires a companion annotation, which provides the values to call the test with. These annotations are what we call sources, and JUnit Jupyter comes with a multitude of those suited for many different use cases.
The simplest form of a Jupiter source is called at value source. It takes in arrays of primitive values or strings and the test engine will call the method with each element of the array at runtime. In this example, two parameterized methods with a value source were created. The first method provides an array of string values, while the second one provides integers. Note how a value source annotation has different names for these arrays based on the type, and this has to do with the restrictions of annotation parameter types in the Java programming language. Also, be mindful that one value source can only hold one of these values at a time, so you cannot provide an array of, say, strings and another one of integers in the same parameterized test. During execution of these methods, an entry is generated for each input, so like each element in the array, and that is provided to the test through its method signature. In the first invocation of the first test method, the value would be two of hearts, for example, while the second invocation would get nine of diamonds, and so on. Before diving into the other sources that Jupyter provides to us, it is important to note that the at parameterized test annotation also has a name parameter, just like repeated test. It can be used to provide a custom name to generated test cases, and Jupyter can then inject the actual parameter values into these names. If you use placeholders like this, the first argument can be injected with curly brace zero curly brace, for instance. Some parameterized tests require more than one input per invocation. A good example of this would be times where you validate a single algorithm, but you need to pass both the input and the expected result to the test. This is a match made in heaven for another type of source used in parameterized tests with Jupyter, and it's called at method source. A method source needs to be connected to an actual Java or Kotlin method by name, and the connected method's return value will be used as the inputs to the parameterized test. Furthermore, this data method needs to be static, so make sure to put it in your Kotlin companion object and use at JVM static so Jupyter can find it. In this integration test, we want to parse card objects from two strings where one part is the rank, like two or queen, and another is the card's suit, like hearts or spades. Let's name the companion's method testData, and its return value is a list of arguments objects. For the record, this could also be a Java 8 stream or any other collection of arguments objects. The arguments type is Jupyter's data container for arbitrary elements. And for the data method, we create a list of these objects through their factory, called off. Now that the data method is prepared, we are going to set up the actual parameterized test, which will consume the data. As mentioned previously, the add method source annotation is given the name of the data method as a string. And finally, the test method signature is extended to accommodate the inputs. Depending on your IDE, you may or may not get some additional help here, and you can see that in my installation of IntelliJ, I will get a warning if the data method cannot be found. At runtime this would generate an error, so it's nice to see this warning ahead of time. Note that because the data method is in the same class as our parameterized test, it's enough to simply state its name. If the data method was in another package or class, the method source cannot find it just by its name. So you would have to add the fully qualified class name as well, with a syntax that looks like this. If you don't want to couple your data next to your test cases, this would be the way to go. Testing a piece of code for each value in an enum type can be achieved with the add enum source annotation, which accompanies a parameterized test. By specifying the enum class in the annotation and adding a suitable method parameter to your test case, JUnit Jupyter will look up all values of the enum and feed it to the test at runtime. As expected from a parameterized test, each input gets its own entry in the test report. An alternative way to group together data for a parameterized test comes in the form of the at CSV source annotation. Using comma-separated strings, this makes for a very concise way of declaring data.
In this example, we add together a few card values and check their sum against an expected result. The parameterized test gets four parameters and we'll have three rows of data to feed to it, so Jupyter will generate three cases out of this method in total. The four method arguments are aggregated automatically from the CSV data. CSV data can be used to drive the generation of parameterized tests through string values on the source annotation itself. However, it's probably more common to host comma-separated values in a different file altogether. Again, JUnit Jupyter has a solution here. Using the at CSV file source annotation, the test engine will read in a resource file and generate test cases for each row inside of that file. The annotation is highly configurable, so you can specify the encoding, delimiters and lines to skip if required. The file is located inside the project as a test resource, here in the data directory, and it contains a comment in the first row, which is skipped by default, by the way. Uh, and after that, there are mappings of cards to their expected values inside of an empty hand. So when I run this test case using this file, 52 invocations are generated, one per line in the CSV file. When defining a method annotated with addParameterizedTest, JUnit Jupyter can convert the arguments passed into the test to the required type. We have seen this in action before with strings and integers, but the actual list of supported types is quite a bit longer. Some notable examples include file objects by using a string as its absolute path, class objects by using a string as the fully qualified name, currency and locale objects by using the string-based identifiers. Finally, the entire Java 8 date and time API is supported out of the box, so a date time string can be implicitly converted to a local date or zoned date type object, as shown in this example. For your custom classes, support isn't always automatic, although JUnit Jupyter makes a great effort to try and instantiate an application's domain class transparently from a given string input. This kind of middle ground solution is what's called a fallback string to object conversion, and we're going to explore how this works now. If your custom class can be constructed from a single string, it is eligible for string to object conversion through the JUnit Jupyter test engine. All you need to provide is one of two things. A, you have a static factory method that only takes a string and returns your class, or B, the class has a constructor that only takes a string. The only restriction that applies to these factories is that they must not be private, otherwise you're free to name them however you like. In our example app, most data classes can be constructed from strings, so let's use this string to object conversion for the card type. This is the factory method right here, located in the companion object of the card class. And since it's been written in Kotlin, we need to mark it with JVM static so that the compiler will generate a properly visible static method for JUnit to discover. When going back to the test code, we can now write a parameterized test containing an argument of type card in its signature. Inside the test, we compare the constructed card's properties against some expected values. At runtime, this object is properly resolved and I can even check its class with a simple lock statement. Again, to prove the point about the staticness of the factory, if I were to remove the at JVM static qualifier, the test would fail with a descriptive message that it cannot construct a card object without one of these factories visible to it. So we've seen implicit argument conversion and string to object fallback conversions now. For any type that doesn't fit the requirements for either of these categories, Jupyter allows you to just tell it how to create an instance of it. This is the third kind of argument conversion, the explicit conversion. To use this feature, you annotate the offending argument with the add convert with annotation and provide a class reference of the argument converter interface along with it. This interface takes a source object and converts it to a target object of an arbitrary different type. There is a base implementation with a slightly friendlier API that I recommend using, and it's called Simple Argument Converter. <laughs>
As with its parent interface, you are handed the source object and also the target type, so basically the class that Jupyter asks you to create from this source. In my example, I register an argument converter for this rank parameter, and I provide the rank converter class. Inside the implementation of this class, we redirect to the factory method for rank objects, and that's it. Now Jupyter can hand off the work to your custom type converter. We have seen how JUnit Jupyter can solve a lot of use cases for parameterized tests with its built-in source annotations. However, the framework maintainers couldn't possibly support each and every single demand that could arise in a developer's code base. Every application is different after all, and so may be its requirements for elegant testing. Luckily, for advanced users, the APIs driving the declaration of parameterized tests are opened up, so you can write your own source if necessary. Now again, this is for advanced users, but I'd still like to explore this. Our goal is to implement a source that can understand JSON arrays and pass a deserialized JSON node to a test method. For the sake of simplicity, I will rely on the Jackson data bind library for this example to do the actual parsing, but this is just for demonstration purposes. Any other means of parsing JSON would work just as well. We will need a custom source annotation as well as an arguments provider that reads the annotation's data and then resolves the parameters of a test for the engine. Now, let's assume that we have built everything already, just so that we can have the finalized desired API in mind for this feature. We have our test method, which will receive a JSON node object. This object will be provided through the custom source. Next, we attach the annotations to the method, starting, of course, with add parameterized test, and then our custom annotation, add JSON source. The way I imagine people using this is that the annotation should get a value called text, which is the string representation of the JSON array to parse. Let's fill in some data and write out the body of the test. The next step in the implementation is providing the annotation class itself. Thanks to the wonders of Kotlin, this is just one liner, and we make sure to add the text argument as well. To achieve a more polished user experience in our IDE, let's also annotate this with JetBrains' add language annotation, so that we get some cool syntax highlighting. Neat! The important part, connecting this arbitrary annotation to Jupyter, now comes with the meta annotation on top of this annotation class. Finally, the last step of the way, the arguments provider itself. It will read from the add JSON source annotation and convert its contents into a stream of arguments, which Jupyter then provides piecemeal to the test method. We implement the arguments provider interface, which contains just a single method. But wait, now how do we access the value written inside the JSON source annotation? The extension model of JUnit 5 provides a handy way to consume annotations for classes that require external input. We will make our JSON arguments provider implement another interface. It's called annotation consumer. This is a generic type that the test engine will feed the annotation's value to. Basically, we register our provider to consume our own annotation. And this new method is where we pull out the data from the annotation. Let's store it inside a variable so it's accessible from the other guy. Now we are ready to implement the provide arguments method. In the JSON JSON library, this is the API to convert a string into a tree of JSON objects. The last thing to do now is convert this JSON node into a stream of arguments, honoring the return type of this method. So we first use Kotlin extensions to create a list from the parse JSON. Then we convert that into a Java 8 stream, mapping each item in the list to JUnit's arguments type. <sighs> that was quite a bit of work, but we did it. We effectively wrote a new feature for JUnit Jupyter, and we made the test engine just that tiny bit smarter to understand arbitrary JSON input with just two tiny classes. When I execute this parameterized test now, each item in the JSON array will get its own invocation, 
and the assertions in the test can use the inputs to validate whatever it is that they want to validate. The introduction of JUnit Jupyter brings another programming model to the table, which has been unprecedented before by the framework. Tests generated at runtime. Effectively, we are able to provide a factory method that can generate test cases during the execution of the test suite, not at compile time. With dynamic test, data-driven tests have finally become a reality. In this example, a resource file is read in at runtime and split into components. Here are its contents, and for the sake of simplicity, you can see that this file works similarly to a CSV file. Each line is supposed to represent one test case, and it expects to be split into three components, the test name, the short name of a cart object, and its more expressive pretty string representation. Going back to the test factory, each line of this file is processed individually and mapped to a dynamic test object through the factory API with the same name. We provide the display name of the generated test as its first argument and a lambda function as the second one. This lambda describes the body of the dynamic test. After compilation, the test factory will generate two test cases on the fly for Jupyter to execute. The test report uses the dynamic test's display name and assigns an entry to each of the items, nicely stacked under the test factory method. So we became familiar with the add nested annotation before, with which we can logically group together tests. Now, something similar exists for dynamic tests as well, because there is a sibling to the dynamic test class called dynamic container. Both of these extend from the same base class, which is called dynamic node. A dynamic container may be used as an intermediate group for dynamically generated tests. Here, a dynamic test is generated for each allowed number card in a standard deck of blackjack. First, we iterate over the available values in the suit enum class. This will give us a stream of four values initially, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Next, each suit object is mapped to a dynamic container through the factory API, which is again named the same as its class. Similar to its sibling, it receives a display name as the first argument and a stream of dynamic node objects as the second argument. Note that this also allows you to nest more containers inside of each other. For our purpose though, one level of nesting is enough. So we generate dynamic test objects from a stream here. Again using a stream, we create a rank object from an integer in this range and use the dynamic test factory to generate our case. Finally, this is where the logic of an individual test comes into play. With everything in place, let's run this test. As expected, the test factory itself sits at the top level. Inside, we have four subgroups, as shown in the test report, with the expected display names. And then consequently, each of these containers holds the test cases with the actual logic. There's an important caveat to the usage of test factory and its features. Specifically, while a test factory does partake in the lifecycle callbacks expressed through before each, before all, after each, and after all, the individual dynamic nodes that it generates do not. This can be easily visualized by another quick demonstration. This test class consists mainly of lock statements and some lifecycle methods at the top. When I run this suite, observe how both test factories produce their log output next to the before each and after each callbacks, like we expect, but also how the statements from these callbacks are absent in between the dynamic tests that it generated. This means that a dynamic test is not integrated in the default lifecycle of JUnit Jupyter. The test factory gets the callback, but the generated tests inside the factory do not. This is not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it's definitely something to keep in mind when dealing with dynamic tests. In JUnit 5.3, support for parallel execution of test suites has been released as a new feature for developers. Now this can greatly improve productivity for your tests, simply because it takes less time to run multiple tests at once.
For this demonstration, I have drafted a terribly slow test class. Two of the three methods here simply put their thread to sleep for a few seconds, and the third one counts to 10 billion just for the fun of it. Two callbacks are added to measure the time it takes to execute this class. When I execute this class on a single thread, it will take quite a while, at least 8 seconds. And it actually turns out it's over 11 seconds until the run finally completes. With parallelism, this can be improved significantly. As you remember, JUnit Jupyter can be configured through configuration parameters, which are provided as Java system properties. To enable parallel test execution, we have to specify this parameter to the test engine. For Java projects using Gradle, the system property DSL can be used to set this up. In an Android project, we use the configuration parameter DSL instead. It's located in the test options block, like so. Finally, when you execute tests through IntelliJ, you need to make sure to add this setting to your run configuration too. From the respective window, you can add the configuration parameter in the VM options box. With this enabled, JUnit Jupyter is prepared to run test cases in parallel. However, the single-threaded execution is still the default mode. To make a test class eligible for parallel execution, you annotate it with the add execution annotation. This is an enum type with two values. Same thread will run all methods in the class one after the other, while concurrent will run them in parallel. If you really want to run your entire test suite in parallel, you can tell this to Jupyter too, so you don't have to add the annotation to all your classes. You do this by specifying this configuration parameter too, next to the other one. Now all tests will run concurrently, unless there is an execution annotation on the class which overrules this behavior. Back to our test class from earlier, I've added the annotation to the class definition now, and also added the parameter. When I run the class now, the enhancement is visible immediately. Now the class can finish in just 5 seconds. I mean, it's still slow, but it's quite a bit better already, don't you think? The mechanism for parallelism in JUnit Jupyter is called a Parallel Execution Configuration Strategy. It's a mouthful of a name, but it allows developers to take complete control over this feature. The main parameter for controlling this kind of execution is called JUnit Jupyter Execution Parallel Config Strategy. It can be set to one of three values, and each of these has a companion parameter that completes the setup of this specific mode. The first mode is called Dynamic, the default mode when you enable this kind of parallel execution. It will utilize the number of processors available to the JVM and multiply this amount by a specific factor. By default, this factor is 1, and it may be changed through this configuration parameter here. This test class exemplifies the behavior of the dynamic strategy. It contains a test factory that generates test cases for us, and these test cases simply hold the current thread for a specific amount of time. So my Mac has 8 cores, therefore we can expect 8 tests to run at the same time. When I execute this class, this can be seen in action. As soon as a spot becomes available after a test has finished, the executing thread continues with the next one that's pending in the test suite. And we can be sure that at most 8 tests are executed simultaneously. Let's tweak the dynamic factor by providing another configuration parameter. Now remember, in IntelliJ we open the run configuration to do this, and we use a value of 2 here. This will tell JUnit Jupyter to take the number of cores and multiply that by 2 to get the total number of tests that it should run in parallel. If the same test suite is executed again, we can immediately see the change visually. 16 tests are now being executed at the same time, in different threads. Another strategy that can be applied to parallel test execution is called fixed. Unlike the default behavior, Jupyter will use a hard-coded integer value as the basis for knowing how many tests it should execute at once. The fixed strategy now requires another companion that actually provides the number, so we add this one as well. 
for demonstration purposes, and because I like powers of 2, I'm going to set this value to 4. This should now tell Jupiter to run 4 tests in parallel at most. Going back to our inefficient test class, we can observe the results after starting the test run. You can see 4 tests are executing at any given time, and as soon as one finishes, the next one is scheduled. The last choice available to developers for parallel execution strategies is the custom strategy. Alongside this value, the implementation of an interface is provided to the test engine using a fully qualified class name. And this class is then used to determine parallelism at runtime. Now, if you want to create a custom strategy, you will need to add a dependency on the JUnit platform engine library and add that to your project first because that is where the interface is located that we need to implement. It's called Parallel Execution Configuration Strategy, and it contains exactly one method, called Create Configuration. Before we implement the body of this class, though, I'm going to register it to Jupyter by adding a system property to the JVM. Setting the config strategy parameter to custom will enable the test engine to look for a custom strategy. And here's the companion parameter, called custom.class, of course with the Jupyter prefix. And this parameter needs to be set to the fully qualified class name of our implementation. This is what the final example looks like. Back to the implementation, the first thing to note is the method signature of the strategy interface. Developers are handed the configuration parameters known to the test engine, which makes it possible to read even more external information from the JVM's system properties here. The custom configuration parameter can have an arbitrary name. However, it's important that its key starts with a common prefix, JUnit Jupyter Execution Parallel Config. If you don't do this, your parameter will not show up in this object. The prefix is stripped off by the test engine before it passes the parameters to you, so be sure to look only for the suffix in the implementation class. In this example, the number of parallel threads to use will be determined by the amount of hearts provided in a config parameter called custom.love. After receiving the parameter from the provided structure, we count the number of heart characters in the resulting string or we throw an exception if the parameter wasn't even given to the JVM. Afterwards, we create a parallel execution strategy object, and that has a couple of methods that provide the runtime environment values for JUnit Jupyter, such as core and maximum thread pool size, number of threads to use, and the parallelism itself, which is the number of threads to run. Our custom implementation will just set all of these values to the same number. Before executing the test class again, the system properties have to be reviewed one more time, because our custom parameter still needs to be passed to the JVM. I'm setting the parallelism to two heart emoji, which will tell Jupyter to use two simultaneous threads for execution, as per the custom strategy implementation. Now observe how the custom behavior is used at runtime. One of the biggest enemies to a confident test suite are flaky tests. We've all seen them before. They pass sometimes and fail at other times. In many cases, flakiness can be traced back to accidentally sharing mutable state in between test cases, which may cause false assumptions for one test if another has modified the system before but didn't clean up properly. This becomes even more of a problem when tests aren't executed sequentially but in parallel, let me introduce you to this test class. Its methods verify the behavior of the global Java system properties and are basically unit tests for the get property and set property methods. I even went the extra mile to prevent accidentally sharing the state because the original values are backed up in an instance field and then restored after each test using a lifecycle method. How wise of me, right? If I run this class sequentially, all tests pass. The big problem with this class, it's a nightmare to a parallel system. Even with the lifecycle methods that clean up after each test, this class will not work if its methods are executed at the same time. 
This is because of this shared state in the system class, which will be read from and written to from multiple threads at the same time. After putting JUnitJupyter into parallel mode and running this class again, we can all see it fall apart pretty quickly. The assertions seem illogical to a sequentially trained observer, but it's clear that these methods cannot be executed together. Now we could disable parallelism altogether to fix this, but there's a better way. Jupyter's Parallel API introduces the concept of resource locks to handle this issue. Think of them as a means to synchronize different threads for tests, similar to the Java keyword of the same name. A resource lock is given a common name that's shared by multiple tests, and whichever thread gets to one of these tests first will become the owner of the lock. Only after it finishes that test, the resource lock will be lifted, allowing other threads to access the remaining methods. The magic is applied through the at resource lock annotation, which can be added on the method or class level. The value of this annotation is an arbitrary string identifier, which has to be shared across all elements that access the same common resource. And that resource then should be locked to a single user at a time. The test engine will make sure to never execute tests that need the same lock together. There's another clever performance tweak which can be applied to resource lock elements. There's a secondary parameter here, which specifies a mode, an enum value of either read or read write. It's up to the developer to recognize the nature of their tests, but in general, multiple tests that only require read access to a shared resource may run in parallel, since they aren't expected to mutate that shared resource. By putting a resource lock into read mode, the Jupyter test engine is told about an exception to the rule for this particular lock, and it will happily execute multiple tests on the same lock again, but only if all of them claim to be read-only.